G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to just give Wondery a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So Wondery's new true crime podcast, The Apology Line, begins with Alan Bridge posting flyers around New York City, asking people to anonymously apologize for their crimes. Not to God, not to the police, but to his answering machine. But within hours, the calls start coming in, people apologizing for stealing, infidelity, lying, and even murder. Alan gets dozens of calls from people claiming to be murderers, but one of them stood out. Richie. He was deliberate, measured, and his calls would leave thousands wondering if he really was the serial killer that he claimed to be. That is, until Richie offered to provide proof of his crimes. The voice acting for this particular podcast is excellent, and there's just something really interesting about listening into stories from people who allegedly are just spilling their heart out with no consequences. And I think that was the really unique and fresh aspect to this particular podcast. I haven't seen anything done like this before, and it was a really interesting listen. So, subscribe to The Apology Line on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wonder app. That's Wondery. Feel the story. It all started when I was five to six years old and had an imaginary friend called Bombo. He was a small Victorian boy who lived with his mother, who I said lived under the floorboards in the house that I grew up in. I used to talk and play with him all the time, teaching him about things like my Velcro shoes and some toys that I had. It was no secret to my family who Bombo was and even what he looked like from how I had described him. One day though, my sister, 14 years old at the time, went back upstairs to our shared room after a family day out and she saw him too, standing in the corner of the room staring at her, exactly how I had described him, even down to the detail of the clothes. Well, a few years passed and I was now 10 or 11 years old. Our family had moved house a couple of times and now I lived in a three-story house in a village just outside of my hometown. I always had a weird feeling about that house too from the moment that we moved in but didn't think too much about it over the excitement of having my own room on the top floor with a skylight. After a few months things started to get a bit strange though. The things disappearing, hearing footsteps on the middle floor landing at night, just weird stuff like that. These experiences progressively ended up getting stranger too, with sounds like nails being dragged up on the railings on the top floor getting worse and worse, as well as some nights my little sister, three at the time, screaming saying that there was a man growling at her in her room, although my family put this down to an overactive imagination and didn't really think anything else of it. It was quiet for a couple of months though before everything just came back again, but this time, so much worse. This was also the first time that I saw it. So, one night I was in my room watching TV and getting things ready for school the next day. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw it. A face peering in at me through my skylight. Its skin was dark red and its eyes were like white with no pupils. Only veins and dark circles around its eyes, leading to like black cracks across its face. It was grinning at me, and even without pupils, I knew that it had its eyes locked on me. Needless to say, after a few seconds of initial shock, I quickly ran downstairs to the rest of my family and refused to go back into my room. Shortly after this too, my older sister who had given birth recently and was living with us temporarily had her own experience as well. As she was sleeping one night, she heard a knock on her door at between 2 or 3 in the morning. Thinking that it was one of us knocking, she shouted what, twice with no response. But then, the door just flung open after a few seconds with so much force that the dresser had dented the door from the impact. She looked, but... There was no one there. Shortly after that, we moved again for personal reasons to the house that we now have been in for years. 
For years, too, there was no unusual experiences other than the occasional sound of footsteps. Nothing that couldn't be logically explained, that is. When I was 18, though, my sleep schedule was the same as any teenager. Waking up around noon and going to bed around 3 or 4 in the morning. And this one night in particular, I was up doing the same as always. Listening to music, watching films, stuff like that. At midnight, or around that time, I went downstairs to the kitchen as usual to get some snacks. And on my way back up out of the kitchen, I saw it again. Standing behind the front door, looking in through one of the glass panels, was that same face that I saw all those years ago. Same red skin, same eyes, same dark circles and cracking features. It was staring right at me too, and this time with one of its hands lent on the other glass panel as it watched me. The only difference though was that this time it wasn't grinning. After standing there for what felt like forever, I ran as fast as I could up to my room and locked myself inside. I didn't sleep a wink that night too. Some family friends who were actually regular churchgoers theorized after they had heard what I saw that this thing that I had seen was actually Bombo, or what had taken the form as him in the first place, and when I had stopped giving him my attention and energy, he had then had to use another way of getting my attention. But I don't know what to think for sure, to be honest. All I know is that what I saw was the exact thing that I saw as a kid, and it came back. It's been four years since the last time that I saw it, and to be honest, I hope that I never see it again. I live in good old northeastern Maryland, closer to Delaware, and during the time of this story, I lived in a fairly new development. My family was the first family that lived in the house. In fact, we owned the house before it was even built, and it's still surrounded by forest and farmland too. I also explored the area by myself a bit, sometimes traveling miles to different areas of woods, sometimes closer to home. And although the forests weren't too thick, they were thick enough where you could be fully encased in them without seeing the edges for a while. I've got lots of fun stories about that place too, but I'll get to this one. So, this happened a few years ago, and I have since made peace with the event as perhaps being some sort of a time anomaly where it was somehow proof that the past, the present, and the future are all stacked on top of each other. I forget the terminology, but... Uh, that's not really important to the story. In any case, I was home with my only mother in the house with me. We had several strange paranormal experiences between the two of us in and outside of the house and around the development too, but nothing like this. We were both upstairs and the layout of the upstairs floor plan had my parents' room on one side of the house and mine was on the opposite side. But between us was a a large foyer type thing that had the steps to downstairs with a tall ceiling connecting the first and the second floor and a large bay window as well. It was midday on a weekend. I was high school age and playing on my phone in my bedroom while my mum was in her adjoining bathroom taking a shower in her room. It was quiet, quiet enough that I remember noting actually how eerie it was. And out of the dead silence I heard my voice clearly calling, Mum in a sort of irritated tone coming directly from the bottom of the steps in the foyer. I remember thinking that I must be hearing things. But then my mum responded, What? In that, I'm in the shower, why can't you kids leave me alone for two seconds of peace sort of tone. But at that, I shot up immediately and sped walked out of my room, hesitating to cross past the foyer, afraid of what I will see standing at the base of the steps. But I said screw it and ran across glancing down the stairs, but when I did, there was nothing. Well, I ran into the bathroom with my mum and all I could say was, Hey mum, th th that wasn't me. What? She replied, that wasn't me. She believed me, having experienced several strange things in the house as well. Most notable, the woman that would walk into my sister's room every once in a while. She usually would show up only in your peripheral, but once I actually saw her head on, but 
That's another story. Anyway, we still talk about it today and theorize what it could have been. I feel the land is haunted or something in general in that area because there's a lot of creepy places and things that have happened there. I still have so many questions though. I mean, could this have been a mimic? Some sort of a cryptid? But is it even possible that they mimic the voice of a person within the area? It's been a good four or five years since this happened and I still can't put my finger on it. But what do you guys think? Any thoughts would be much appreciated. About 10 years ago, I was on my way to work and made my usual stop at the Speedway to grab a Red Bull. I made this stop pretty much every day, so it was routine for me. On this day, however, I was already about 15 minutes late for work, but whipped into the gas station anyway. As I got out, there was clearly a strung-out girl pacing by the entrance with a baby stroller. I assumed this lady was going to approach me when I got out of the car to ask for money to buy food or something. The Midwest is filled with dope heads, so I braced myself for the awkward encounter and I headed in. What happened instead, though, is that the lady bolted in front of me with her flip phone and stroller in hand and started begging me for a ride up the road. Initially, I declined, but she just would not stop pestering me. I got past her by my Red Bull and I head to the car and as I get to my car she reappears from behind my car and starts begging again. This time she flashes a photo of her baby on her phone and tells me that she just needs to be dropped off up the road. I eventually go, screw it, I'm already late for work anyway. So she hops in the back seat with her now clearly empty stroller and instructs me to drive towards the bypass close to my work. As we drive, she keeps telling me to just go straight every time I ask how much further it is. But we're now well away from the city and it's all country roads. I eventually lose my patience and very firmly tell her that she needs to either give me an address or get out of the car. She throws $3 into my passenger seat and begs me to just turn onto this random gravel road. I turn down it and I instantly notice that the only thing on the road is a beat up vehicle blocking half the gravel path. And at that, I instantly pull off the side and tell her to get the heck out now. She begs to just take her down to this vehicle because it's her boyfriend and he has her kid. I tell her that if that's true, then he can drive down the road and pick her up. She texted on her phone for a second and without another word, she just hops out. I'm officially sketched out and I flip when I just see in the rearview mirror, this vehicle hauling its butt behind me, the lady is now gone, and turning onto the bypass opposite me. I ended up calling in since I was running about 30 minutes late after everything anyway, but I'm 100% certain that I was about to be robbed by crackheads or maybe even worse. Between the fake baby photo, the empty stroller, and the shady dirt road, and the vehicle that was just sitting there, I was pretty shook for a good week. I grew up in Australia, and when I was in high school, I used to get the bus home from school every day. The bus stop was about a 10 minute walk from my house. I did this walk every afternoon by myself and it was always quiet. I remember this day vividly. It was 2009 and I was 13 or 14 years old. I can't remember what time of the year it was that it happened, but I was in year eight in high school. I got off the bus and there was this tall, dark haired man wearing a gray trench coat. I think that he was also wearing makeup maybe, standing at the bus stop when I got off. I thought to myself that, man, he looked creepy. And it was strange that I had never seen him before. He smiled at me and I put my music on through my earbuds and began walking home like any other day. But when I walked down the alleyway to my street, I started to get this weird sense like something was wrong. So I turned my music down and I could hear loud footsteps behind me. I was too scared to turn around so I just started walking faster. But when I finally did turn around, 
It was the same creepy dark-haired man from the bus stop. I felt my stomach drop and he was about five meters away from me now and he yelled something out to me but I couldn't quite understand it. He either yelled, I'm going to rip you or I'm going to get you or something like that really loudly. But I sprinted home in shock and I didn't turn back. I eventually lost the guy, but man, it was a creepy experience, that's for sure. The song playing through my earbuds while I was running home was ready or not, and I'm 25 years old now, female, and whenever I hear that song, it always haunts me. This occurred in 2017, and due to a multitude of factors, including a recent death of a close friend, I was unbearably depressed at this time in my life. For that reason too, my family flew across the country to visit me in LA where I live, and we thought that it would be nice to visit Catalina Island. But when we arrived, it became apparent to us that it was the off-season pretty quickly. It was late November, the weather was cold, and as a result the island was nearly empty besides locals and a few straggling tourists such as ourselves. But our first priority was to ditch our luggage so that we could explore the island. So we immediately checked into our motel, though that word motel hardly does the place justice. I call it a motel because all the doors to the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality, our room was one of 20 to 30 quaint guesthouse looking buildings arranged in a sort of horseshoe shape around a walkway with rooms on either side of the path. The entrance to the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe and if you walked dead straight, you'd reach the room where we were given, essentially on the corner before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So from our room, one path led back to the street and the other further into the secluded maze of rooms. Stay with me here too, because this is important. So after a day of exploring and having just finished dinner, it was time for a cold, dark walk back to the room. The island is a decent distance from the mainland and let me just say, it gets dark. Similarly dark was my headspace too after the dinner conversation took a left-hand turn and my overwhelming depression got the best of me. So I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and I walked ahead of my parents to the hotel room, telling them that I just needed to go to sleep. And I did, immediately. Depression sometimes makes that easy. I was already losing consciousness as they entered after me, but I drifted off without so much as a good night. But I then woke up to my mum saying my name, a harsh whisper. The room had two beds, my parents' bed closer to the door and mine further into the room, but my mum's voice cut through the silence again, and she sounded concerned for me. I didn't blame her considering my mental state at the time. Groggily, though, I rolled over. What? I asked, as my eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains. I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in my bed, her eyes got wide, because if I'm in my bed, then who the heck was she talking to? We both looked back to where she was previously looking to see a hooded figure in all black just standing over their bed. Now, it's hard to define just how horrifically startling this was to be on an island in the middle of the ocean and wake up to see a hooded figure just looming over you like that. This moment seemed to last forever, though. Life isn't like the movies too, where characters unleash a blood-curdling scream or something like that. Sometimes the only thing that comes out is something panicked and guttural. And my mum's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice that I have never heard her use before. And then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and just truly unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way it crouched was so absolutely unexpected that even in regards to this already unexpected situation, it just terrified me. It seemed sort of animalistic, maybe. I knew two things, though. This hooded figure had definitely been standing over us sleeping, and it wasn't acting in any sort of way that I could understand as logical. As opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago, 
The series of events that unfolded when my hulking ex-military dad woke up happened in an instant. Suddenly, we were at the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mum was screaming, get him, get him. My dad was running down one path of the horseshoe further into the hotel, shouting through sheer adrenaline, I'm going to kill you. I ran down the other path towards the street, and when I got there, not a sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to the room to find my dad quietly walking back, his head low. He gets really close to me, and I hear him say, It's a kid. The explanation? Some young teen, tall and lanky as I am in my 20s, wearing all black, including a black hoodie, went into the wrong room. Our room. The one time my parents just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mum woke up when he entered, and seeing a tall person in a black hoodie, thought that he was me, assumedly leaving the room in a depressive episode. And when the hooded figure crouched, that was him realizing his mistake and panicking, because he was terrified of us. As I got back to the room, my mum walked out and hugs this kid, who was now crying his eyes out. I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with murder in his eyes. But in the end, he was okay, and so were we. But man, it was a fright, that's for sure. When I was 17, I worked in a really large mall at Vance. I had a lot of creepy older guys come in and flirt with me, but one guy in particular took the cake. Now, one day, I was working the usual busy as heck Saturday nights, and there were four very tall men that asked for help getting some shoes. I worked in an outlet, so the store was large with tall racks. The mall that I worked in was extremely popular amongst locals and tourists alike, but the mall has some history with being a sex trafficking hotspot for context as well. But anyway, the men said that they were from Nigeria, and honestly, they were pretty chill at first, until they began to flirt. One man kept saying that he was a son in Nigeria and asked if I wanted to wed him. I laughed because I thought that he was joking, but suddenly he looked extremely offended. I was awkward for sure and began talking about the shoes, but the man interrupted me with saying how great his son was and that I would make a great wife. And at that point, I grew uncomfortable because I didn't want to be rude, so I asked for a co-worker to come over to take care of them while I went to the bathroom. And everything was normal for the remainder of the shift. I clocked out and I was waiting for my dad to come and pick me up. I usually walked around the halls of the mall as I waited. The music was soothing and all was calm. I walked past a restroom hall and saw figures standing in my peripheral. I glanced and saw that it was the four men from earlier. I began to panic at this, but I sort of just played it off. I smiled at them softly and kept walking so that they didn't think I was being rude. But sure enough, they began to follow me. I picked up my pace hoping to find other people walking around, but there was no one. I was speed walking, but the guys were definitely keeping pace with me, which troubled me, obviously. My thoughts were to just go to the bathroom so that I could lose them, so I entered the next restroom hall. I walked slowly, thinking that I had lost them, but soon after, I heard pounding footsteps in a hurry. I looked back, and they were there, coming right for me. I didn't think the bathroom was an option anymore, and I started yelling for help. I ran straight for the employee corridors of the mall, and right when I got through the doors, thank the heavens above, a security guard met me on the other side. I bumped into him, and I've never felt more relieved in my life. The men took off the other way instantly, and the guard let me stay in his office until my dad came. All I can say is, I thank God for that guard, because he wasn't there, I probably wouldn't be writing this right now. So this all happened roughly, I would say, three to four years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it happened. I'll start off by saying that 
At the time, I was pretty young, single, and very keen to have my first experience with a guy. I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people, until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting and we had a lot of things in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with him since we'd been talking for almost a month at this point. Now, even though I was only young, I wasn't completely naive or stupid. I was and still am a very cautious and paranoid person, but for some reason that day I made what possibly could have been one of the worst decisions that I have ever made in my life. I invited him to come and spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend and I had the place to myself, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived around three to four hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to come and see me. So he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11am. The whole time he was driving to my place, I just had this sickening sense of doom though. Almost as if something was going to go very, very wrong that night. I almost texted him multiple times to tell him that I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. And I jumped up as I heard his car pull up and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door. But instead he just sort of pushed his way through and continued to stare at me blankly. All whilst my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never ever do to pretty much anyone. And things instantly seemed extremely weird. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me, which I hesitantly went along with, as this was my first experience with a guy, especially as he was almost six years older than me, so I was pretty tense. But fast forward a couple of hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which confused me as it was only like 5pm, but I told him it was fine and I would continue to watch movies by myself downstairs. After an hour or two, I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around and the sound of him talking. So I made my way upstairs and opened my door to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed, where he sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes and put his hands around my neck lightly. Now, I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, which worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat and said, Does anyone know that I'm here? Do your friends know who I am or what I look like or anything like that? I instantly answered saying that my sister and friends who live nearby me this was a complete lie, mind you, as I don't have a sister and my friends were completely unaware about what was going on. But something inside of me just forced me to say it. After minutes of awkward silence, he just stood up to gather his things and I noticed that in his backpack he had tape, rope and handcuffs, which at first didn't concern me as I knew that he was into that stuff, but looking back, I... I think it was intended for something much, much worse. All of a sudden, though, he said, uh, I think I'm going to go head home. I've got a long drive and I'm pretty tired. Well, I didn't hesitate to let him out of my door as I was already extremely uncomfortable. But as he left, he failed to make any eye contact or say goodbye, and he raced off down the street as soon as he got into his car. I ran back to my room to check if he had left anything as he left in a hurry. And I found a note on my desk with the words, Being nice is what saved you. At the time, I don't think I really realized what that note meant, but now that I think about it, I seriously think that he had very ill intentions towards me. I'm still angry at myself for even letting a stranger into my home, which is obviously a huge mistake. And I immediately blocked him on all of my social media after this, and I still beat myself up over it. And I know that I'm really lucky that I made it out of that one alive. All I know of him, though, is that he's now somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say now is that I'm really glad that he is many, many miles away from me. This is my aunt's story. 
In the summer of 1975, my aunt was a college student here in Utah and she went camping with her boyfriend and another couple up American Fort Canyon, a beautiful place 40 minutes south of Salt Lake City. It began raining really hard earlier that evening and so most people left their campsites. When it stopped raining, my aunt and her friends made a campfire and got on with their festivities until after dark when it started raining again. The other couple decided that they didn't want to camp in the rain and so they left. My aunt and her boyfriend, my now uncle, huddled together in their tent and tried to get to sleep. But my aunt suddenly heard distinct footsteps not too far away from the tent. She sits up and listens. They're getting closer and closer. She sees a quick flash of a flashlight which turns off again immediately. And my aunt tells this as well, she always says that her first thought was that it was a park ranger coming to tell them that they had to leave due to flash flood warnings or something like that. So she called out, who's there? The footsteps stopped. This woke up my uncle and they listened for more movement. They both talk about how scary it was because it was hard to distinguish between footsteps from the sound of the rain. It was the middle of the night as well, up in the canyon with... No one around for miles. They decided that if they heard anything spooky one more time that they would leave. So they waited and waited and finally they started falling asleep when suddenly they were woken up to the soft sound of their tent zipper slowly being unzipped. My aunt screamed and my uncle jumped into action by grabbing his heavy metal flashlight and whacking the person on the other side of the tent door as hard as he could. Whoever was on the other side of the tent gasped when it was hit and ran off. My aunt and uncle ran like mad for their truck about half a mile away and discovered quickly that the back tire had actually been slashed. They were able to drive somehow to a gas station a few miles out of the canyon still and call 911 at a payphone. The next day they went to get all of their stuff with the police who found male footprints all around their tent. They never did catch the guy, but here's the creepy part. None of this is proven, but it's a spooky thought. In the summer of 1975, several women went missing, and it's been discovered that that was when Ted Bundy was living in and terrorizing Utah. And guess where they found some of the bodies? In some caves up American Fork Canyon, and only one mile away from my aunt's campsite. Only a week before my aunt went camping was when Ted did his thing and murdered one of his victims and hid her body in that area. It's also known that Ted Bundy was a necrophiliac and would return to visit his victims' bodies often. But my aunt and uncle wonder if, perhaps that night, Ted was visiting his collection of bodies when he saw a prime opportunity and nearly took it and prowled around the campsite. Also... Ted Bundy has a distinct chip in his front tooth and my uncle likes to joke that he gave it to Ted by whacking him with the flashlight. Now, all of this is speculation of course, but doesn't that just kind of give you the chills? How close they were to being harmed in the middle of the night like that? In a campsite with no one around? And right next to where Ted Bundy's gravesite was.